You're such a tool. All right, anyway. I should probably edit that out. Probably. Nah. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome back, Camden Catholic. Welcome back, Honors. All right, so this is going to be one of the more awkward flips that we've done all year because there's about, like, 19 people in my room, which is making me really cringe extremely hard, and one scumbag teacher, if you want to call him that. Wow. All right, so anyway, now, so we left off in most of the class today looking at this overhead view of the trench system. Are you shooting staples at me? You know, like, like, so, shooting... Oh my god. All right, so this overhead view of the Western Front, right? So as we were talking about one of the main focuses in class today, we were talking about how intricate trench warfare was and how it wasn't just something as simple as a ditch facing another ditch and then everybody shoot at each other, which is mostly how middle school teachers teach it, of it being like, oh, they were underground. All right, well, no, there's a lot more to it, all right? And as you can see right here, something you should jot down, no man's land could be as wide as 50 yards or up to a mile, right? So also remember there were 444, 440 miles of trench on the Western Front. Isn't it like 440 miles? Yeah, it's like Northern France all the way down the border of Switzerland. Why didn't Switzerland get involved? Because they're Swiss. All right, like, so, because they're Swiss. All right, so, anyway, there's actually a really, really cool research study to why Switzerland never actually gets into wars. It's mainly just because they have, like, five different dialectical different languages and a lot of different amalgamous cultures, so they're actually blended together so hard they don't feel like they can choose a side. I didn't know you have that. one more. All right, so, there you go. All right, so, anyway, let's keep moving, though. So, all this stuff is going to result in a massive stalemate, right? So, Territory is going to be gained and lost at, like, fractions of a time. Very, 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 very small. What am I looking at? It's wrong. All right, so anyway, now. So, during the trench warfare, though, massive stalemate, particularly on the Western Front. Ironically enough, there was not much of a stalemate on the Eastern Front whatsoever because the Germans were absolutely mushing the ever-loving daylights out of the Russians, mainly due to the fact that the Russians were so... Poor! All right, the Russians had no money, and they also had a very inferior industrial system. So they ended up just going, uh, 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 and just destroying them royally. All right, so anyway, now, territory, though, is going to be gained and lost yards at a time, causing, however, massively catastrophic human costs. When we started this entire, like, unit, we talked about how 40 million died in World War I which is an egregious number compared to the Napoleonic era, the U.S. Civil War, the Seven Years' War, many of the wars that actually had come before it, right? So, not to mention the fact, too, that there were massive losses incurred due to the fact that no one was prepared for a war like this one. It was, po you're such a tool, it was post-industrial, right? And so no one really knew how to fight it. The trenches were a reaction to the machine gun, and a way that people believed they were going to be able to win this war was from this call called going over the top where people would literally blow a whistle and you would charge out into no man's land. Which, no man's land, of course, is filled with a lot of hazards. The biggest of them being landmines, uh, dead bodies, down planes, barbed wire is another one as well. All right, We talked about the landmines and how they were planted from underneath, right? So, the human cost during these is going to be absolutely catastrophic, right? To break stalemates, both sides are going to attack very, very aggressively, central and allies anyway. And the biggest battles that you can actually reference back to in World War I are particularly like the Battle of the Somme. <laughs> All right, so the Battle of the Somme is a massive one where over a million people were killed in a matter of about five hours. And that's where the first tanks are going to make their debut. Then another one is Verdun, France, where massive trenches ex were extended in this thing called the Race to the Sea, right? 500,000 are going to be killed or missing in Verdun, France. In Verdun, France, you still have to actually, you can go see where some of the old trenches are, old uh, artillery shells, and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for World War I is in Verdun, France, which actually I can show you a picture of really, really fast. Um, on, no, I'm not going to use yours, you tool. Unknown Soldier Memorial... Verdun, France. So, in Verdun, France, so many people were actually killed that the Douaumont Ossuary was actually going to be built, which is actually the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which has a massive, massive, massive gravesite, but also inside of the big obelisk in the back are piles on piles on piles on piles of bones. Where are they? Yeah, I don't want to look at your picture on this flip. That's stupid. Um, soldier Bones, France. I, I know, we talked about this already. Uh, like, so, all right, so, oh, here we go. 
just giant, giant piles inside of this Dumont ossuary. Inside the building itself, there are just piles on piles of bones that they actually found in Verdun in France, which is absolutely terrifying when you think about it. Now, also the Second Battle of Ypres, where 10,000 are going to die from solely poisonous. So, getting into it, though, as you can tell, World War I is a dauntingly horrific and scary war. This is images of no man's land, actually, during the war itself. What used to be lush green farmland and good territory to actually make your life on turned into barren nothingness where if you actually even ventured out into it, you would surely be dead, right? So neither side from any of these battles is going to win any major advantages as well. One thing you do need to remember, though, is this is always go this is going on on the Western Front, right? The Eastern Front, the Germans and the Austrians were absolutely plowing through the Russians, and the Ottomans as well, right? So getting into it, though, the things that make this war so scary and so intense are the technologies that were used to fight it, all right? So what I need you to do really, really quickly is I need you to write this list down. So go ahead and pause this video real fast, write this list, and while you're writing this list, leave about two blanks below each weapon because I'm going to tell you a couple of facts about them because on your final you might need to list them all right so not all of them but a select few number of gun or like select number of weapons all right so I'm gonna let you pause it do your thing all right so we're back again right now the machine guns are one of the biggest proponents of course the original model was the high is Hiram Maxim's Maxim gun right now a couple of cool facts about the machine guns used in World War One. They are heavy, they are bulky, they take at least three men to operate, right? Also, they have water jackets around the outside of them. So the machine guns from World War I actually had water cylinders that went around the barrels to keep the barrels from overheating and then warping. Now, if you accidentally ran out of water inside of it, what'd you have to do, Zach, if you ran out of water from the gun? Yeah, you got pee in it. And again, I would have stage fright, I can guarantee you, that I would have to be like, huh? Not in a pool, you sicko. Oh, like, hey, you sicko? Everybody, Natalie... We know what she does over the summers. I like so. I didn't say your last name, so it doesn't really count. All right. So anyway, now so, but no, you would have to actually pee in the gun, which is really really messed up. Now anyway, fun fact though, the uh, World War One machine guns would also fire on average of about 200 rounds per minute, which is actually bush league by comparison to a modern machine gun. However, it's still crazy intense when you think about war technology up to this point. Yeah. Exactly. Then the biggest one, the next one, artillery shells and artillery in general, right? So this is what artillery looks like, all right? A lot of kids every single year never really know what artillery looks like, but these are artillery guns. The one on the right right there is actually known as Dick Bertha, which is German for Big Bertha, created by a guy, I can't remember his name, but he named the gun after his wife, which I feel like many women would take as an insult. All right, so... That particular gun could fire over a mile, and the way that these things work is, as you can see, this man is standing next to an artillery gun right here. They're basically like giant guns. They're cannons, but instead of using a cannon ball, they use a shell, and when the shell impacts the ground, it explodes. There are actually a lot of unexploded artillery shells in World War I fields today. If you want to actually plow a field in France, you have to call the government, and they send an armored tractor to come out there and do it for you so you don't end up killing yourself. Isn't that crazy? I know, in a first world country, that's what's scary about it. Then, like, not to mention the fact, too, that that weapon right there, that weapon caused the most deaths in World War I. Artillery shells claimed the lives, I, mean, I think it's like something like 15% of all deaths in World War I was from artillery shells, right? So, and then going back, oh, grenades! Grenades are one of my favorite weapons. So, first of all, grenade, from the French word grenate, which is French for pomegranate, all right? So grenades are named pomegranates because what happens when you split open a pomegranate? Oh, little seeds come out because that is what kills you when it comes to a grenade. It's the shrapnel. It's the pieces of the item itself. It's not the explosion, right? Grenades came in very, very handy, particularly for Americans due to the sports that we played in our leisure time as well. Americans have sports like baseball, football, things like that. So we had the ability to throw a grenade much further, and that's why we designed ours in that style, which is called a pineapple-style grenade. Whereas the Europeans would design theirs with sticks on them, in particular the Germans, and they called them potato mashers is what the slang that American soldiers would actually use to reference them. So that's a grenade, right? Then going into it, then you got poison gas, particularly mustard gas. Now I don't have a picture of poison gas itself. Nerve gas is a modern thing. But poison gas and gas mass were a major influence in World War I. You had three types of gas from World War I. Chlorine, mustard, and phosgene. Phosgene spelled P-H-O-S-G-E-N-E. 
which is the most deadly out of all of them, but was only really used in like late 1917 going into 1918 because they had just developed it. Scary part about phosgene, apparently it smells like musty hay, and so if you smell it, you're pretty much dead in 48 hours. Because it would actually cause massive amounts of internal organ failure and bleeding as well. Pol Pot? Pol Pot used a lot of stuff. Well, chlorine gas, the thing about chlorine gas is if you use chlorine gas, it doesn't actually kill you. Chlorine gas just hurts a lot. It causes blisters when you inhale it. And it like, so it like parts of your body would swell up, fill with pus and things like that. What's the one that was the Japanese subway I don't know. You might need to look that one up. Now, anyway, so here's the other thing, though. The mustard gas is the most common one. So mustard gas, name that because of its yellow tinge, all right? First thing it does to you whenever it hits you, causes you to go blind. Your ocular cavities start to bleed, right? And then what ends up happening, the reason why that happens is because it's an area of major amounts of blood flow, right? So mustard sarin. gas, sarin, sarin gas. gas, yeah. Uh, so mustard gas causes your blood vessels to dilate so severely as they try to basically gasp for air that it causes massive amounts of internal bleeding, all right? So you basically then end up drowning to death in your own blood. Isn't that nice? Because the bronchial tubes inside of your lungs open up to try and grab it more oxygen, and it just streams blood out into your lungs, and then you end up dry drowning on land. That's poison gas. Now, the allies and the central powers are also going to develop gas masks to try and circumvent these things, which is a genius idea. The original gas mask was just pee on a piece of cloth and shove it on your face because the ammonia in your urine would actually counteract the gas. Yeah, you know. Trench warfare, of course, is another like technology. The trenches are going to become much more efficient as time goes on. Tanks? Tanks are a big one as well. Now, do I have a picture of tanks? Yes. Right here is the Mark I tank, right? The Mark I tank is a British design. The very first tanks didn't even have guns on them. The very first one only traveled at five miles an hour, and it was called Little Willie. And it was just a device to try it. It was a big metal box to get you from one trench to the other without dying. That's almost as slow as you are. Uh, thought you were going to make another joke that was going to be super inappropriate, and I was going to have to, like, black it out on, like, the... Nope, that one's safe. All right, cool. All right, so anyway, now, so anyway, now, Little Willie only traveled about five miles an hour. Now, Big Willie, on the other hand, when they developed him, he traveled about 10 miles an hour. So tanks would then be eventually armored. Tanks would also be later be given genders. Male tanks had heavy cannons on them. Female tanks only had machine guns. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, like so. Yeah, there you go. So now the scary part about it is what the russian tank looks like all right it's a russian tank world war one it's like a dr seuss tricycle of death uh where's that there it is it's called the czar tank look how stupid that thing is like yeah, well, yeah it's russia for you all right so anyway now so don't speak of the motherland like that now anyway now no, so the motherland's that one right there. <laughs> and, and then of course you have another mu major major developments you have zeppelins which were used for bombing runs you had airplanes, which are going to be brought in as well. Now, airplanes were originally used for reconnaissance. You know what reconnaissance means? Recon. Recon, right? Going out and finding where the enemy is. Now, the issue is, eventually, pilots are going to run outside to each other, and you're going to start shooting at each other. Yeah, that's called dogfighting, right? The original dogfights were actually with no, revolvers. It's called, dog it's called dog fighting because every time somebody would be on your back, you would pitch up into the air and your engine would stall out. And every time you kicked it back on, it would backfire and it would sound like a dog barking in the distance. That's why they call it dogfighting. The original dogfighting, though, is you would literally pull a revolver out in your plane and try to shoot the other guy in the other plane, which is a terrible idea. Now, eventually, though, planes will then add submachine guns onto them. Now, that's only because a man came around by the fantastic name of Anton Fokker. And Anton Fokker invented the Fokker Scourge. This is history. All right, so anyway, now, so, and the Fokker Scourge actually was a device to where the propeller was the firing mechanism for the guns itself, so you could fire through the propellers and then shoot other planes down, right? Which is another very intensive, like, weaponry advancement as well. So, and then we're going to get into it. That's one of the biplanes. That's another one. Oh, tail gunners was another big thing as well. And then here's the other stuff, though. Now, fortunately, Russia is going to be super poor and poorly equipped to fight this war. So their entire effort is going to go south really, really quickly. Some soldiers didn't even have rifles. The Eastern Front was dominated by the Germans and gets pushed all the way back into Russia. Also, one, <laughs> one, it looks really weird that just your hand is just like, like that. Get off me. All right, so now, one other weapon was completely ineffective on the Eastern Front because it was so cold. It was uh, gas. The gas would actually freeze inside the canister so they, so they couldn't throw it at the Russians. 
And the Russians didn't have gas because they were so poor. All right, so they did have bomb dogs. That was really messed up. Bomb dogs was the thing the Germans used where they would actually strap an explosive to a German shepherd and send the dog out there. Now, the Balkan states like Bulgaria are going to join the, uh, the Central Powers to try and defeat Serbia. And then, of course, you can jot this little stuff down. The Ottomans are going to join, it's supposed to say 1915, not 1914. But they're going to start actually join up officially in 1915. Uh, late October of 1914, they're going to make moves. Now, war is even going to erupt in Africa. The colonies are going to battle one another. They're going to draw lines by who they were owned. Australia and New Zealand even sent troops. And the Indians, actually, they just sent set boys because they were under British control. And America still remained uninvolved. All right? So that's it. That's World War I in a nutshell. Most of the technology used to fight it. All right? So we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow when we have your quiz. Do not forget. I'll see you guys later. Have a good evening, Camden Catholic.